Thank you very much for coming. The British urbanist Isaiah Berlin. You know Isaiah Berlin? The British urbanist Isaiah Berlin authored a well-known parable of the hedgehog and the fox. Berlin juxtaposed the behavioral qualities of the two animals, each representing an extreme personality type. The hedgehog is the quintessential unifocused persona, single-minded, unequivocal, the prototype introvert. The hedgehog marches a straight line to a goal. Baron Hausman and Robert Moses are urban hedgehogs. So is their colleague, Tom Gilmore. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> There's more. The fox has a more complex and subtle repertoire, a range of objectives, a variety of strategic options. The fox is the prototype extrovert, a man of diverse tactics. The fox is a dancer, the shuffle, the glide, forward and back. Lewis Mumford is an urban fox. So is his colleague, Tom Gilmore. Gilmore frequently quotes Mumford's bleak 1950s prognosis of the coming American city. In that tangled mass of highways, interchanges, and parking lots, the city would be nowhere, a mechanized non-entity ground under an endless procession of wheels. In that, in that disconcerting forecast, Gilmore recognized his adopted home. Is that an echo? In that disconcerting forecast, Gilmore recognized his adopted home, the ground under nowhere of downtown Los Angeles. Fifteen years ago, Tom initiated an unrelenting effort to reimagine that downtown. The goal? Pure hedgehog. The operational tactics? Pure fox. The transmutation to somewhere in large part succeeded. Gilmore delivered a transformed downtown, and that's not hyperbole. Tom Gilmore substantially altered the life form and the form language of downtown Los Angeles. Tom clearly owns that impetus to a changed city. His focus was the old bank district, but reimagining downtown doesn't end there. The Gilmore aspiration is a continuing hypodermic for downtown LA. Housing where there was little, rehab where there was less, restaurants where cuisine was rare, green where there had been mostly black, white, and gray. Homelessness addressed, not homelessness ignored. The sidewalk is Gilmore's venue, never the street. The pedestrian as primary subject and object. Gilmore is not a man with exotic or utopian or esoteric goals. Gilmore is a man with plausible, manageable, achievable objectives, almost. Architecture not sine qua non, rather architecture as a city's strategic colleague. Livability, walkability, workability. Not the Ramblas or the Ringstrasse or the Champs Elysees or Fifth Avenue. That's downtown Los Angeles Gilmore's talking about. How does he do it? How does he do it? How does he do it? Start with persona, sometimes a laugh, sometimes a scowl. Can you take a punch? Can you throw one? Sometimes a solitary advocate sometimes joined by fiscal and political colleagues. Buying, selling, negotiating. Building, demolishing, negotiating. Leasing, 
renting, negotiating, greening, remodeling, negotiating, cordiality and muscle in equal proportions, the cajole and the hustle, making friends, making enemies. And Gilmore keeps the target moving. Next zone of operations, east of Maine, west of Syark. So Lewis Mumford is celebrating the dissipation of downtown's non-entity ground under. Isaiah Berlin has added Tom Gilmore to both Hedgehog and Fox lists. And one final item. To ensure an ongoing replenishment of the urban hedgehog fox quotient, Tom Gilmore donates a million dollars to endow an urban teaching chair at Syark. The city chair is forever affixed with this Machiavellian homily. The greatest good to be done is that which one does for one's own city. Please welcome that urban do-gooder, Tom Gilmore, to Sire. Here we go. Well, I think this is going really well so far. <laughs> I, think we're doing, I think we're doing fine. Um, Eric, thank you so much. Um, I was prepared for something else from uh, Eric, as most people are. I was warned, actually, before I started this, that I should relax, enjoy myself, and ignore Eric's introduction entirely. Um, I've been introduced by Eric before, and um, it's quite an experience because usually the first part, you know, I, he's got me. He, 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 it's, it's, it's poetry in motion. I, I'm, I'm listening. I'm, I'm rapt. And, and then it all drifts away from me somehow. I, don't, I, I hardly know what he's talking about. And then at the end of it, he all wraps it together with a nice bow, and I think, I'm nowhere near as smart as I should be. I need to listen to Eric more. Um, so Eric, thanks to you, thanks to the board, thanks to the faculty, um, thanks to all of you for coming here tonight. Um, the city chair, uh, it, it's an interesting idea. I mean, we, we tossed this around, I, I was, hanging out at home one day, um, thinking about death, and, uh, and realized that I started to need to make a, uh, a plan for what I was going to do with you know, the, the money that would be hopefully left over uh, upon that great moment. And um, the first place I thought of was SciArc. Um, part of it because um, I've been on the board now since uh, 2001 and because it has earned uh, an extraordinary place in my heart, uh, and it also uh, has earned itself an extraordinary place in the city of Los Angeles and in the architecture world. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a fascinating thing. What, what it's for, I'm gonna put on my glasses for one second so I read this properly. It is a challenge to think about and to rethink and to re-rethink how cities work or not work in their role as the primary residents of the world's population. This school, arguably the most creative architecture school on the planet, and this city, arguably one of the most important cities during the next century, are perhaps the best possible places to take on that challenge. Or we could just leave it to others. I say we do it, and I say we do it here. So let's talk about cities for just a second, and actually, First, let's talk about the place they occupy in the world. I'm always amazed by this image, and I know, you know, this image didn't exist 10 years ago or 15 years ago. The, the notion that we could look at the earth from, from out there and see it at night in, in, in high def um, was pretty extraordinary to me. But what it did do was make me think how vital cities are. Every one of those lights represents literally hundreds and thousands and millions of people all working together on this planet, all connected in some way. And so I thought, we, you know, this, this city event, this thing that unites all of us on this planet is something that we need to talk about because of its impact on architecture and architecture's impact on it. But first, 
I want to talk about myself for a little while. Why do I want to talk about myself? Because my journey is not unlike the journey of this city. Nice picture. This is me here, like that. Um, the reason I showed you this picture is because I've never showed this picture to anyone before in my whole life. Uh, I felt we should share this uh, because this is the moment of awkwardness. This is the moment when you're 15 years old and you're graduating and, you're, and you're, your gown is too short because you've grown to six feet tall at 15 years old and you're with your parents in the suburbs of Long Island. And it, it represents to me the moment at which I was so lost that the idea that there would ever be a grown up Tom Gilmore was unknown to me. I grew up, I was actually born in Manhattan, uh, right in the middle of Manhattan in, in, uh, on 72nd Street. Uh, I was born in Lenox Hill Hospital. The myth is that we lived in the Bronx, and that was true, but my mother was giving birth on a subway, and the nearest station was 72nd Street, and so I was born in Lenox Hill Hospital. I asked my father to verify that yesterday, and he said he didn't remember. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's a thoughtful family. After that, right after that, we moved to the suburbs. We moved to Long Island. This is a much nicer suburb than the suburb I grew up in. This part has green in it. My neighborhood had no green whatsoever. And so I lived in the suburbs for most of my early life. Then I moved to the country by myself. When I went into, when, after I got out of college, I moved to a farm, um, like most people did in the early 70s. And that's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what all 1970s farmers looked like, just in case you want to know. And then I woke up and moved back to the city and, and shaved my beard off. Um, and, and New York was the most informative place in the world. I, I hate to say it, but it, it's true. I love Los Angeles. Los Angeles is my home. It will become an extraordinary city over the next series of decades to come, but today, that's a hell of a city. That's a great city. I moved out to Los Angeles, which was a real shock to me. Uh, I was so used to the world of New York. I was so used to the density. I was so used to the vitality. I was so used to the interaction of people within inches of each other that coming to LA was an enormous letdown. It was everything every New Yorker had told me it would be, that it wasn't really a city, that it was just a bunch of highways, and a little downtown that no one ever went to. And I couldn't believe it was true, and then when I got here, they were right. And I, I, was, I was just shocked by the whole notion that somehow the second largest city in America was in fact a pretty dysfunctional city, that it wasn't acting like a city at all, it was acting like a giant suburban sprawl, not unlike the suburbs that I grew up on Long Island. So I was a little strange, a little weirded out by that, and so I thought, I need to get to know more about this city. So I spent some time looking at it, and I started to focus on downtown. Bear in mind, when I got to LA, it took me a year to get downtown because I was dealing with some architectural projects uh, out in Beverly Hills. I was working with some people in Manhattan Beach. I was doing some stuff in Century City. And no time did anyone tell me to come downtown. At no time was there a notion that anything of any value was happening downtown. And when I came down, I realized why. Because when I came down here at 5.01, the streets were empty, completely empty, with nothing, not one person. They had all come into the bottom of buildings in their cars, and they all had left. The car had finally conquered Los Angeles. The, the notion of a city was really just going to be a place where you worked and then you were gonna fly out as fast as you could and get to your suburban home, and Los Angeles was going to have this sort of bellows of in and out, and at night, it all went dark, and no one was there. I don't think there were two bars in all of downtown, and both of them were over here in the Arts District, I think. So it's, Los Angeles was a great shock to me, and I realized that I needed to do something. I was in an area called the Old Bank District, or actually it was in an area that would be in, end up becoming called the Old Bank District. It was just a bunch of old empty buildings that my partner Jerry Peroni and I were walking around. They were all empty financial buildings in, in the area of 4th and Main, 5th and Main, uh, all, that whole area, Spring Street. Those seven blocks were all empty. 
and we realized that there had to be some kind of an intervention. She was from New York, I was from New York. We both had some sense that you could reanimate a city, that in the process of reanimating one little part of a city, you could have some kind of a catalytic effect and maybe drive more things. And ultimately, we were lucky, we were right. And it's 15 years later, and it's a, it's a fundamental change, a seismic shift, you can even call it. I call it an axial intervention. Let me take a look at this. About three, four years later, uh, a crazy group of people from SciArc, a school that I had actually lectured at in Venice, um, was thought, thinking about coming to downtown. Eric was involved, Neil Denari was involved. It was, a pretty, it was a pretty preliminary look. They were searching all over Los Angeles to put a place for SciArc. And SciArc at the time, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, board, and feel free to yell right in as you want. At the time, SciArc was focused on projects. They were beautiful places, incredible design, you know, wonderful, thoughtful, extreme design, but it was focused on those designs by themselves, pretty much. Now, there were exceptions, I'm sure. Anybody, anybody want to jump in on that one? You all right? It was interesting because where they were working was not truly an urban environment. They were working outside of the urban environment, and so that the way they were thinking was to do these extraordinary creative designs in the isolation of, the Mal of Malibu, the Santa Monica Mountains, some you know, wonderful place all by itself, sitting not next to anything else, just a wonderful piece of art and architecture, isolated and alone. And then their move downtown was transformational, ultimately to both downtown, which they had an enormous effect on, which you all have an enormous effect on for those people who go to school here, but also on, on the pedagogy, because at a certain point, their proximity and your proximity to the city forced SciArc to begin to contemplate its place in that environment and ultimately in all city environments. And so something began that made me think that at a certain point, we need to foster that, and, and not, not, to, not to advocate for cities, not to you know, uh, uh, be boosters for cities, but to understand the incredible relationship between cities and architecture. And it's a two-way street, obviously. So what is it about cities? Cities are, cities are so extraordinary. I've been really lucky. I've been traveling around lately. Uh, I've had a little time, thank God. So I've been running around a little bit, trying to look at those cities that interest me, that, that, that challenge me, that make me think that it's more than just a conglomeration of buildings. It's more than just a cacophony of architecture. It, there is something incredibly organic about them, something extraordinary about them, and I needed to see more of them. So I'm, let me just go through a few of them. This is, no, you know, it's London. This we have to talk about later. It's very important. <laughs> That's Dubai, Rio. The cities happen in, in every single portion of our world, and they all respond to something that's going on geographically around them, socially around them, politically around them. Tokyo is an amazing place. Paris, which we'll talk about later. Shanghai, which we'll talk about later. These, there's a certain similarity to all of them. There's certain verticality, certain density, certain, certain compelling mass to them, but they are, are all so fundamentally different. San Francisco, which is amazing to me that San Francisco exists in California. I don't know, I don't even know what I mean by that, but I think you, <laughs> don't you all sort of feel that way? I don't know. But, so why is it cities? Why, why am I obsessed with cities? Why, should, why am I asking you to be obsessed with cities? Because in them they hold an enormous amount of information for all of us. They are, they are the touchstone for every civilization in the history of this planet. Everything that happens, happens in cities. It happens faster, it happens harder, it happens in a more dynamic way. It has from you know, Machu Picchu to Athens to Rome to Beijing to wherever it is, these cities and the architects that work within them or the designers or the, or the kings or whoever was involved, that is where the best of everyone did what they did. Because you could do wonderful things out here, but ultimately if you did wonderful things out here, sooner or later you would be called to the city. Sooner or later you'd be called to Rome, you'd be called to Athens, you'd be called to wherever it was because the challenge was in the city. Because it's not like 
an isolated place up on the hill. You're, you're going to do something that is going to interact on, a, on an exponentially more complex level than what you were doing when you were just working inside your own brain. While I was looking around, it's really interesting to see cities that appear to be on the upswing and cities that are on the downswing. And it's really compelling because there's enough mass in all of these cities to be, to be moving forward, and yet through a series of terrible decisions or lack of interest or economic or political or social uh, uh, events, they begin to turn and go into decline. Most of the cities that I look at that are in decline don't have to be in decline for long. There's no reason. Some of them are in economic decline. Some of them are in cultural decline. Some of them don't know who they are in the first place. Um, the, some of the more interesting ones um, of the ascendant cities, sorry, I should have gone that way, um, London is extremely amazing. I, I always thought London was sort of a, you know, it's a lovely, charming, you know, it's a, it's a delightful city, you know, but, but ultimately, London has done something that I haven't seen a lot of other cities do. It has taken its history and it has taken new architecture and slammed it together. They, they have much less and I won't call it respect, but they have much less regard for, for freezing the city in a moment in time and much more regard for being able to constantly reinvent themselves. London today is nothing like what I remember it even 15 years ago. When I was there just a few months ago, I was shocked about, by how animated it was. I had been shocked by what they had done with the Tate and what they were doing on that side of the river. And ultimately, I'll show you uh, one of the things that Renzo's working on. That's an incredible piece there. Um, New York, I don't know when New York wasn't an ascendant city, except for the time when I lived there in the 70s when it was really not an ascendant city at all. When New York was going to hell in the 70s, it was, it, it was a function of that incredible suburban sprawl that ultimately killed LA, at least for a few decades, but New York was suffering from it as well. But New York recovered amazingly quickly and is truly, I mean, my God, it's just so dense and beautiful. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Tokyo is incredible. Berlin is incredible. All these cities seem to be moving in an incredible direction. The declining ones, I feel so sorry that my partner Pete McLaughlin is here from Detroit um, because the top left one is Detroit. Detroit is a perfect example of, of a city that hasn't been adaptively reused yet. They haven't found their way yet. They haven't found their new voice. They haven't in introduced enough new architecture. So it's, it is still in decline, although I think only a couple of years away from actually making moves in the right direction. Um, Cairo, I'm not sure Cairo was ever an ascendant city, you know, and, and maybe it hasn't been for at least the last four or five thousand years, but it should be. It, it, its key location makes it as, as important as New York or London in its own way, and yet it's, it's not an ascending city. Um, I was just in Lima, that's a shot I took in Lima. Lima is a city that's still lost between the old and the new. It hasn't found its way yet, and the architecture reflects that. There, it, it's very disjointed, sad, combinations of architecture that have not redefined that city. And, and, and it's really, it's an unfortunate thing to see. And I don't even know what the last one is. Who can name that last city on the right? What is it? No. Manila. Well done. Um, <laughs> but it's the same thing. Manila, Manila doesn't have a heart yet. It, it hasn't found an archi architectural iconography or anything like it to begin to drive it into a new century. And so Manila is sort of, who, who is, you know, who is Manila on anybody's must go list? No. <laughs> new York? Pretty much, you know. Rome? Yep. London? Paris? Tokyo? Shanghai? Yeah. All right. But Manila? No. It's not there. Then there's bipolar cities. France is bipolar, I mean, not France, sorry. <laughs> Paris is bipolar um, in a very interesting way, but I think it has a lot to teach young architects and old architects in that they have made a fundamental decision. Now, they may be questioning that decision a little bit right now because I have seen some wonderful new things within the old city, but they have bifurcated their city. They have created La Defense up on the hill, you know, a few stubway stops away, and they have taken the old city and said, no mas, this is it. Or what's, instead of no mas, what would they say? 
French for no mas? <laughs> Jerry? You don't know? God. No, okay. All right, thank you. I can't even pronounce it, so it's all right. <laughs> but that Houseman's Paris is still Paris. It's still the same. I mean, it's a beautiful place. I love it. I, I, I go there twice a year. But it's still, it's, it's Paris. I feel, like I'm, I feel like I'm going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in every building. Every building looks like it's static to me now. And it doesn't mean they're not beautiful, and it doesn't mean they're not charming and wonderful and romantic and all of that, but they're not dynamic. They're not new. They're not part of a new lexicon that, that schools like this are constantly working on, on coming up with. Amazingly enough, uh, Santiago, Chile, same thing. They have a beautiful old city, and, and now there's a whole new section of the city. You don't even see the new towers that are in there, but, but Cesar Pelli is doing his thing. By the way, is Cesar Pelli building too many towers now? I think so. <laughs> Somebody else needs to get a chance. I really believe that. But Santiago is the same way. It's a bifurcated city. They have made a fundamental decision that the old city will be one way and the new city will be another way. It's fine. I'm not judging it. But it's, it's not real. Folks, speaking of not real, you can argue with me about this, and I'm okay with you arguing with me about this. But there are certain cities that, that are, are, are growing by leaps and bounds. They're doing so much economically. They're doing so much politically. They're doing so much socially. They're doing so much culturally. They're doing shit architecturally because what they've decided to do in a case like Shanghai is just, just build it and wipe out the old city. Just, I was in Shanghai about two years ago. The towers were being built and literally 50 feet away was what was left of the old city. And there was a map that showed each block as it was going to be torn down. Without any regard for what actually was gonna be built there yet, it was just a notion that the new stuff's going here because the old stuff's got to go. It's, it's a really rudimentary way to look at urban renewal because there are many ways to look at urban renewal, but that's not a particularly good way to do it. You don't just wipe the slate clean. And, and so it's, it's tough. It's really no different to me than Vegas. It's no different to me than Disneyland. And, and Mumbai has the same problem with it at the moment. So, so they, they fight this fight where new architecture doesn't in and of itself make great cities. Great cities don't in and of themselves foster great architecture. They, they, are not, they are related, but they are not integrally woven. They don't, one is not a cause and effect of the other. And I think it's important to realize it because it means that you have to make that connection between great city, great architecture. Okay, I need to take a drink. Everybody can take a drink if you have water. And I'm going to take off my jacket. It's funny. Um, I have to thank the um, intern who was working with me, uh, Minori Sumanasinga. Minori, are you here? Minori. There you are. Uh, Minori did a great job. Minori is a student here. And we talked about this. Um, lecture before we got started on and she helped me a lot with it. And I was having a problem because I don't know if you realize it, but there's at least three different separate groups of people here. There's faculty and board who already know that I'm a little off, so it's okay. I can speak to them reasonably well. There's friends, family, and the general public who already are aware that I'm a little off. And then there's the student body who I really don't know at all. Even though I've been to some of the juries and I've walked through the school, I really don't know you, the students. So what's paramount in your minds may not be paramount in my mind. And in the process of creating the city chair, I have to think about what it means to you even less than what it thinks about to me. So Minori was incredibly helpful. And I just want to say, if anything goes wrong during this thing, it's entirely Minori's fault, not my fault. <laughs> it's a perfectly delightful girl, but you know. Um, and, 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 and so we went back and forth, and one of the things, this was a quote she grabbed. This is, not, this is a quote I said, but this is something that she forced me to put up on the screen um, because I think it means something. And, and it means something not just to me, but it means something I hope to you. And that is absolutely literally 
that the evolutionary, uh, evolution of cities is constant and it's incremental. That's such a simple phrase, but it's so absolutely true. All of the faux cities, all of the overplanned city, the Robert Moses things, the Houseman's things, da, 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 are all these massive interventions, massive clearing of the slate, building a new city, and, and yet they miss the fundamental component of cities, is that their evolution is constant and incremental. And that is the door, that's the big, fat, wide open door available to the students of this school and to every architect in America and throughout the world, is that incremental change happens building by building. It's, it's essential, it's, it's extraordinary, and it's the way it should be. Now, except Paris, of course. And I already mentioned Hausman, so I won't, I won't get on him too much. Washington, D.C., which is really just Paris on the East Coast. Or Brasilia. Now, this hurts me because, I mean, who doesn't like Brasilia as an architect? There's something wonderfully compelling about Brasilia. It's, the, it's the, sort of the last great master plan city, but ultimately succumbs to the same, if not worse, failure as the other cities, in that the rest of the city has had to grow in spite of the master plan. The human part of that city, the new architecture of that city, has to grow against and, and, and around this incredibly strong master plan. While on some level, I think every architect on the planet should see Brasilia, I think most people wouldn't want to live in Brasilia. It's the same with Washington, D.C. Now, Minori and I also had this discussion about context, because she was very concerned, I think, that when I talked about context, I was going to do it like a preservationist, because my buildings are relatively historic, and, and you know, so I must be concerned about context in a historic way. I'm not at all, not even a little bit, because context is so much more complex than that. Context is, in fact, social, cultural, political, architectural, economical, and technological. And all of those are changing at the same time. Context changes as well. Context isn't static, which is, which is something that most, and again, to my preservationist friends out there, it's, this is not a criticism of preservation. It, that's a monolithic view of context. Context is on the move all the time. One of my favorite places in London, this is a picture I took when I was walking around during the financial district uh, in London. And, you know, here, you know, and I'm no great fan of the Gherkin, you know, I mean, it's nice, it's all right, it's, not, it's no big deal. And the Lloyd's building is okay, and it's kind of, you know, it, it's kind of like Pompidou without the color, you know. It's, there's a lot of stuff going on, but when you've mashed them together like this, cities do this incredible thing, the energy that's generated by these one, two, three, four periods of architecture or styles of architecture, all smashing into each other, is incredibly dynamic. They're not hurt by the fact that they don't particularly relate to the one next to them. Their density doesn't require that they particularly relate to the one next to them. They, as a group, begin to work. They have redefined the financial center of London, and I think ultimately in a positive way. New York, it's, New York, it's rough. I mean, if you're the little, you know, salmon-colored building in the middle of all that. Once, that little building over there, that was like, the, that was the king building. That was, that was, that was one tall-ass building. That was, that, that had all the might that Wall Street could bring to it. And now, it's completely surrounded by towers. And not in a bad way. I've been in that building and I've been in all the buildings around it. They, they respond to each other in a very odd way because they accept the notion of density. The interesting thing is that Pelly's towers over there, the far ones, and there's nothing wrong with Pelly, it's perfectly okay. Look at the distance between those. That's a planned pair of towers. There's actually a third one, which is precisely the same amount of distance from the second one, which is precisely the same amount of distance from the third one. And it's fine, but it doesn't have the wonderfully insane collision that the other buildings have because it's a little too planned. The ones in the middle, which are very clearly unplanned because it's like, well, we're going to throw this one and then I have land and we're going to build this, become extraordinarily dynamic and I think are an incredibly successful project. Successful projects are interesting because it's not, and again, Minori, wherever you are, don't, don't worry, I'm going to get home on this one. It's, it's not all about the architecture. It is a lot about the architecture. But you can have a great building 
that is not catalytic. You can have a catalytic building that is not great architecture. They don't have to be the same, but when they are the same, they're extraordinary. And now I'll, I'll show that I'm 10 years behind everybody else, but because I have to talk about Frank, because he is on the board after all. Years ago, when Bilbao was built, the Guggenheim was built, um, you know, it was boom, it was a big splash, everybody went crazy, it was wild. And they said, uh, well, have you heard about the Bilbao effect? It was like, oh, the Bilbao effect. And to the general public, and I don't know if everybody was part of it, the Bilbao effect was take a sleepy city anywhere in the world, add a piece of extraordinary architecture, and in this case, extraordinary architecture executed very beautifully within the context of the city, and it will change your city. It will absolutely fundamentally change the sleepy little town of Bilbao, which is not that sleepy, by the way. But this piece of architecture fundamentally altered Spain's notion of what Bilbao was, fundamentally altered our notion of what Bilbao was. We can't think of Bilbao without thinking of this building. So it was a catalytic project. It made a huge amount of difference because it was, it was interesting architecturally, clearly, but it was also catalytic. It actually changed the world around it. A building in London that I just saw, which I was surprised that I feel this way about it, but I, I thought I'd share it, um, is uh, Renzo's shard in London, which, by the way, big, it's a shard. You know, it's, it's a tower. It's, it's a pyramid. It has shards. It's nice. That's not it at all. It's, it, that, that's not what makes this a fascinating building. What makes this a fascinating building is the bottom of this building. If you look at the bottom of this building, and I'm sorry, but I took the picture that way. That's my fault. You look at the bottom of this building, that's the train yards, and this should be particularly interesting to us because of our train yards here. Um, that's the train yards that run into London. And what he did was completely, and I mean completely, integrate rail, bus, automobile, and pedestrian. So I walked across the bridge from um, the financial district in London. I walked across easily. It wasn't like walking from here to downtown, you know, to the rest of downtown. It was an easy walk, you know. Walk across the bridge, walk the pedestrian way directly into that area, into the building, with absolute, complete access to train, bus, cab, my car, whatever I wanted. Because he had decided that, or somebody decided, and he, and he executed, who knows, that the essential part of this building, the essential part of, of connecting this entire area to the rest of the financial district in London was going to be based on the, on the human interactions at the base of the building. That he was, gonna, he was gonna create this, you know, lovely tower and it was gonna do what it was gonna do, but really the exciting part of this is on the bottom. Tom Main did an amazing thing. Uh, you know, Cooper Union, it's like building next to Cyark. You, you have to be careful what you build next to Cooper Union. Cooper Union has the problem of being an incredibly dynamic urban neighborhood that at least for many years was locked into a certain architectural style, whether it was Richardsonian Romanesque or whether it was townhouse style or something like that. And Tom made, I think, an extraordinary decision to, to go very Tom on this and, and you, know, you know what I'm saying. It screens, there's double layers, it has all that piece. Uh, and, and ultimately create something that half the neighborhood hates this building, but the other half of the neighborhood loves this building. And it is, it is, by my account, a catalytic building because it changes the dynamic of that neighborhood. When it had this august institution in the middle of it, it also sort of put it to the test and said, you're Cooper Union, can you handle this? And I think that that's, I, I think it's an exciting project. I think you did a great, great job on it. You know, I'm not Rem's biggest fan, but when I saw this CCTV tower in Beijing, the interesting thing is it, it is, you know, it's a big cherry on a, on a, on a cupcake. You know, it's, it's a big, big statement. But the way it is done and the neighborhood it is done absolutely generates a new generation of buildings that are happening around it. It is its own statement, but there's a secondary and a tertiary level that begin to grow around it that now respond to hit. He's created a new center in this part of Beijing and it's actually very, very effective. And then let me talk about my favorite stuff. Because I like all that stuff, but I like this stuff more. 
Axial interventions. It's my word. I admit to it, and you can make up your own if you want. I don't care. But it's based on the notion that catalytic projects are, are bold statements that, that affect an area dramatically, no question. Axial interventions are perhaps a little more subtle in the sense that axial interventions, if they're successful, fundamentally alter the axis of entire neighborhoods and cities. That, that the work they do, whether it's direct or indirect, ultimately gets followed by so much more work that it, that it changes the nature of an area in a positive way. Now, in my own, you know, with all due humility, in a weird way, our little boxy old bank district in, in downtown Los Angeles, without building one new piece of architecture, which I hope to cure someday, was an axial intervention. It fundamentally changed the conversation about Los Angeles. It fundamentally changed the way we dealt with downtown. It fundamentally altered the gravitational pull of downtown. And, and we, were, you know, we were saved by that because we would have went broke otherwise. But it really was an axial intervention. I'm, most of you guys know the parasol. I'm sure if you haven't seen it, uh, Mayer, a uh, German firm, did it in Seville. If you've been to Seville before, Seville was one of those towns that could have ended up doing what Paris did or what um, Santiago Chile did. They could have just built a new city somewhere. And instead, they, they built this market uh, place, the parasol market, which is an incredible, you know, it's an all wood structure. I don't have to tell you all about it, but it's an incredible intervention that actually went smack in the neighborhood of a, uh, smack in the middle of a historic neighborhood and was meant to connect dots. And in fact, I think does it incredibly well. Now people will argue there are plenty of people who hate this, by the way, and plenty of people like it, but is that anything new in SciArc? No. I think, I, I, has there ever been a review where everybody liked your stuff? No, well there's not, in the real world there's not either. But the parasol is an amazing project because it does interact so incredibly. Zaha's uh, Maxi Museum, uh, I think is another one. I think Rome, you know, talk about a tough town to do new work in. I think Rome can be very, very difficult um, because you are surrounded by history that goes beyond just plain old history. It's, it's Western civilization history, which is, you know, it's a rougher standard to fight. Um, I think Saha did an unbelievable job on this um, because she went cheek by jowl with all the historic structures around her but created a circulation pattern, even with her in her own building, that was so dynamic and so exciting that all of this area has changed because of it. And, and I think a lot of architectural discourse about interventions like this was changed because of it. Two of our own. One, the top one is Tom Main's plan for um, the Olympic Village uh, in New York. That was a really, if, if you get a chance to pull it up online, pull it up online. It's, an it's a very interesting intervention on the southern tip of an area in Brooklyn that faces Manhattan because it was designed, he didn't get the competition, unfortunately, because they didn't get the Olympics, um, but it was designed in a way to evolve. It was, it was not designed as one thing. It was designed as numerous things that would ultimately intersect with the rest of the city. And then our own Eric Moss on bottom, who, for those of you in the student body, how do I say this politely? Culver City was a shithole, is what I... <laughs> Culver City was a bunch of industrial buildings and then a dead little downtown that nobody wanted to go to. That they, had, they had removed the red line when it was going through there. Nobody wanted to go to Culver City. Culver City was a wasteland except for Sony. That was pretty much it. And, and in collaboration with his developer, Eric came up with a way to cha fundamentally change not just the architecture of the Culver City, and, and particularly the industrial area of Culver City, but to change the notion of what Culver City was. Half of the, new, the artists that live down in Culver City, half of the movie makers that are there, half of the graphic designers are there, are there because Eric made it available to them as, as a viable alternative to other creative space. So it's a big deal. But the one that kills me, the one that, the, the one that the one that intrigues me the most, the one that I think that if, if you're thinking about this as an architectural student or anybody else, is to look at the High Line in New York. The High Line in New York, now this is also Minori who bothered me about this because I was trying to go through what projects really fit the bill 
of axial intervention. And, and Minori just, you know, immediately went, well, what about the High Line? And I went, oh my God, of course, the High Line. The High Line, for those of you who are not from New York, again, 15, 20 years ago, lower west side of Manhattan, they had just rejected an entire plan for big highways coming along the coast of Manhattan. It was going to be this big deal. It was a big fight. Jane Jacobs was involved. It was this whole thing. And it got shut down. And then everyone in city government and everyone in the planning community all, you know, were shaking their head and going, what the hell are we going to do with the Lower West Side? It's a nightmare down there, the meatpacking district. It was, it was awful. And, and so what ended up happening was the big plan got set aside. The, the giant urban renewal plan was, was no longer part of the, the mix anymore. So what had happened was incremental change began to occur in that area. Slowly but surely, little residential populations started coming in. Nothing big, a little here, a little there, a restaurant here, a bar there. And, and the old abandoned railroad tracks, the old High Line, which had been half torn down, was becoming a problem. What are you going to do with the High Line? And there were a lot of weeds sort of growing in it. It was becoming this nightmare. So long story short, through an incredible combination of architectural, political, social, cultural, neighborhood, technological, everything you can think of that makes architecture so damn fascinating came together on this project. And it didn't just create a nice little garden running through the air in the lower Manhattan. What it ended up becoming was a developmental spine, a thing that everyone began to try to build more things around to integrate with and to ultimately enliven this part of town. It is, it's extraordinary. I mean, now it's almost too extraordinary because they have to extend it now. They've got all sorts of, you know, it, it, it's suffering from a little too much success. But it is an incredible intervention. It is an axial intervention in the best sense of the word. And it actually happens to be axial, which is kind of weird, uh, in the sense that it actually cuts through buildings. It slices through neighborhoods, but not like a highway slices through neighborhoods, something that engages the neighborhood, something that actually makes people able to build around them. I mean, that, that is the old High Line. That's the High Line before they did it. That was, that's the, 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 the genesis of the thought of the High Line was that, hey, crap is growing there. We should, we should do something about that. We should figure out how to imagine this as a walking garden in the middle of the city. So, and this is my last slide, so I, I hope there's a couple of questions otherwise. I, but this is just to the students now. Let me just say something just to you. I don't care what anybody else thinks. Just to you. You can, you can throw out everything I just said because that's my opinion. That's, you know, that opinion will be worthless three years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. It doesn't make any difference at all. What you can't throw away is this. What you can't throw away is is this planet. If you had taken this picture 150 years ago, this picture would show no light whatsoever. The world has fundamentally changed so dramatically in the last 200 years that now we can literally see the map of the Earth without a single line. And we can see it in the pitch dark because technology, social interaction, Everything that we're talking about, geography, have all played a part in, in waking this planet up. And the people who, who will carry this to the next level, bad news, are architects. It's you. It's the, if you don't interact with this, you can, you, you can be artists, and there's nothing wrong with artists, because we have a lot of artists here, but it, that's an internal process. You have to have an external process. You have to see that ultimately the work that you're going to do for the rest of your life will be directly involved with the map in front of you. So it doesn't matter what I think. I was never, it was never meant, the city chair was never meant to promote a way of thinking about cities. It was to simply recognize that thinking about cities is essential. And that's what the city chair is about. Thanks a lot. I'll stop it.